Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is David Yermak. I'm a finance professor at NYU. And I've been studying this area for about six months, which I think makes me the longest <laughs> professor. You know, I, Last fall, I was just taken by the incredible rise in Bitcoin, which is you know this part of the graph right here. And I found, really to my surprise, that nobody had done any academic work in the economics and finance area. At least there have been a lot done with cryptography and some in the law reviews. Um, but I've been following this area very closely. And we're going to actually offer a course on this at NYU next fall, a joint law and business course taught by me and a colleague who specializes in banking law. And we think it's the first of its kind in the world, and hopefully we'll produce students that meet a market need for people with an acquaintance with the regulatory and the financial issues in this area. Now, my talk is virtual currencies, and I'm really not going to talk about mobile payments, but systemic risk or disruptive innovation I'm going to suggest there's much more systemic risk and much less disruptive innovation, at least so far, than meets the eye. Um, there's a lot of evangelical discussion of Bitcoin and Aurora Coin and, and many of these other platforms, but a lot of this discussion proceeds in the face of the facts, which are that these currencies are really hard to use and that the rate of adoption has been small. Um, I went online to see what Rice Krispie Treats cost if you want to pay in Bitcoin. And it's 0 0.0301 Bitcoin. Now, I don't know immediately if this is a fair price. And in fact, because Bitcoins right now are about $440 each, the price of any cup of coffee or any reasonable good or service is going to have many leading zeros and decimal points. People can't compute those. Even smart people with university training can't compare prices, can't have points of reference that would make them comfortable spending on those goods. If I want to walk into a shop and pay with Bitcoin, it takes 10 minutes to verify that I really have them. If 10 seconds passes on my credit card, I think that's a long time. 10 minutes for a Bitcoin? Get real. Um, not so many merchants. If, if you want to meet people in New York and then bring a meeting to a quick close, say, I want to go get a cup of coffee. Where can I go to pay in Bitcoin? And then there's just silence, even from these big promoters of investment funds. Um, in a city like this, where there seem to be Bitcoin people crawling out of the pavement, you can't actually use it anywhere except a couple of bars downtown. And the bottom line is that you need to be a pretty sophisticated computer user to set up these accounts. People talk about this revolutionizing payments in the third world and poor people using this to revolutionize personal finance. I suppose a poor person with a master's in computer science <laughs> would well, but there are very few such people. Um, the whole rationale of these virtual currencies is to cut out the middleman so that the credit card processing fees disappear and it becomes much cheaper. The middleman is not gone. Instead, you have these digital wallet services playing, as far as I can tell, exactly the same role as MasterCard and Visa in charging even higher fees. Um, so I think for whatever we read about the Sacramento Kings or Richard Branson will fly to the moon with Bitcoin and so forth, there are really very few merchants who take it. Um, I got into some of the data, and if you look at the worldwide merchants who use it and the transaction rate, it's well below one transaction per merchant per day. In fact, Bitcoin transactions are really quite rare. And um, I think really the hype has gotten way out ahead of these. Um, I think it's also well known that Bitcoin doesn't behave the way that most currencies behave. The volatility is 9% per day which for a financial asset is extraordinarily high. It exceeds any currency or stock or commodity that you can really use as a reference point. And it doesn't even follow the law of one price, which is that if I look at different Bitcoin exchanges at the same moment in time, I can find very different prices, often on the order of three to five percent different difference because there's no arbitrage mechanism that you would have with a regular currency. Now, let me talk about some of the risks, and I think a lot of these issues are not well understood and potentially, if this ever catches on and becomes big, potentially threatening to the economy and the structure of commerce. Um, in the old days, I think it's well known that money was kept in a bank vault and you would worry about robbers coming. And so long ago, governments evolved a system of deposit insurance. Um, these days, there's been a lot of theft of Bitcoin. I saw one estimate that 10% of all Bitcoins ever mined have already been stolen. 
And so we have these cold storage schemes where people use virgin devices and use couriers to hide them in mountains that are safe to nuclear attack, you know, whatever. Um, you're worried about this guy who actually looks an awful lot like this guy, just has a laptop instead of, you know, running away. But insurance at this point is strictly on a do-it-yourself basis. You're supposed to kind of figure out your own security. This is grossly inefficient. You know, the reason that we have governments providing deposit insurance is that the government is the cheapest cost avoider. This is a very straightforward concept in law and economics. It's very inefficient if millions of people all have to go make up their own insurance and bear that risk as individuals. So something has to be sorted out here to just have integrity of the payment system. And um, I think if you look at Nakamoto's original paper, actually go back and read it, this is his main selling point, that he's trying to reduce fraud. That there's credit card fraud, there's skepticism about the honesty of customers. Fraud to date is a much bigger problem with Bitcoin than it is with MasterCard and Visa. And I think by that yardstick, which is the one he himself, or I'm not even sure who it is, he, she, it, but Nakamoto's own benchmark for the success of Bitcoin has to be declared as not having been met anywhere near close to what they intended. I think, paradoxically though, regulators have to worry about this a great deal because consumers, one way or another, will expect insurance of these transactions. There will be political demand for it if Bitcoin acquires a critical mass or if any other currency does. And what you're hearing these days is that these digital wallet companies, which kind of, you know, there's some device like this where you carry your Bitcoins around, these are going to hire private insurance companies to subcontract with Lloyds of London or somebody like that to ensure the safety of the deposits. And if that's the case, um, it really bounces right back into the lap of the government because the government then regulates the insurance industry and ultimately guarantees the integrity of those, of those companies. So I think one way or another, governments are going to be dragged into the deposit insurance business, and potentially this is very risky given how, how you know, vulnerable the security has basically been up to now to fraud and, and other ways of stealing. A second area altogether is that the commercial law that has evolved over decades or even hundreds of years seems not to fit well with certain problems that are raised by these virtual currencies. And I'll just give you two examples, but you can really dream up a pretty long list with a little bit of imagination. Suppose there was a company that lost half a million bitcoins in Japan and it went into bankruptcy. And then suppose a month later about a third of these bitcoins were found. Now, who gets those bitcoins? In a regular liquidation, this would be done pro rata. I think almost every country in the world has the limited fund idea that the loss would be shared equally. But with virtual currencies, you can tie them back to individual people. So they found bitcoins, are they my bitcoins? And for a third of the people, they will say, I want 100 cents on the dollar because I can identify these are all unique and those are my bitcoins that can be found. I don't know what the right answer is to this. We usually treat money as fungible and that one dollar is as good as any other. But I think here there's a very interesting problem that I suppose the Japanese courts will have to sort this out, but every nation will sort it out and it will be very disruptive basically to the market for credit. What about the guy from Silk Road? The government wants to seize his bitcoins for using them as part of contraband and there are interesting legal issues about that and so forth. But suppose the government does want to foreclose or more generally that any creditor wants to foreclose. You go, you get a court order, and then where does the sheriff take that court order? You know, these kinds of currencies are designed to be beyond the reach of the legal process. And because of that, I don't think they can really be used as collateral. They can't be treated the way property ordinarily would be in a financial market without the cooperation of the um, owner himself. And in the case of Silk Road, I don't believe that's going to be forthcoming. And you can imagine many such cases where it would be a problem. So, we have to reinvent a lot of basic debtor-creditor commercial law from the ground up to accommodate these digital currencies. This, I think, will be good for lawyers, good for professors and so forth, but in terms of the efficiency and the liquidity of the, of the markets for just ordinary commercial transactions, very disruptive. Um, corporate governance, 
I, I'm not aware that anybody's thought much about this, but the longer you look at it, the more it becomes a big issue with all of these decentralized currencies. Bitcoin is basically a bunch of code that people voluntarily opt into and run on a computer network. And you can join the network and start running the code. And who's in charge is really nobody. The code itself is in charge. Now, from time to time, the code needs to be updated. And so, really, governance of Bitcoin reduces to a simple question. Who has the right to change the code? Now, it turns out that anybody can change the Bitcoin code. We could do it here today and post a new version. And what matters is how many people voluntarily adopt the new code. And basically, if the code is amended and 50.1% of the people adopt it, the rules of the game change. And so, this seems virtuous in a sense, in that it's decentralized, there's no dictator, it's purely democratic. But in economics, we have a class of problems involving collective action of groups that are, at a very basic level, well understood as being susceptible to manipulation through games like The Prisoner's Dilemma. And so, what do you worry about? Um, suppose somebody wanted to sabotage the system. And this might be a thief, or a terrorist, or Putin, or whatever. Um, there's a couple of things that just seem like elementary strategies. One is to create some sort of temptation you know, in the prisoner's dilemma form, where you know, maybe the first person to adopt the code gets 10,000 new Bitcoins, the second person gets one less, and you start a race to implementing something that for the individual adopter is good, but for the group is very destructive. So economics is full of these collective action problems, and this just seems like a very natural setting for a saboteur to apply them. A second thing you could do is introduce 50 new versions of the code at once that are maybe indistinguishable, but that you know, if you adopt this one, if you adopt that one, and then the network would just collapse because there would be no critical mass of people running the same software, and commerce would, would simply stop and grind to a halt with no clear way to restart it. Um, I just thought of these myself in five minutes, and I'm not you know, a hacker type, but I think people who do this for a living would have little trouble at figuring out how to bring this thing down if they truly wanted to. This is very risky if you're going to have a society organized around these currencies. And as much as people admire the cryptographic logic behind Bitcoin, these were not economists or game theory people who looked at it. And a guy like Thomas Schelling, given five or ten minutes, I think would just take this thing apart. Um, this is Paul Krugman saying that Bitcoin is evil, and he's got you know, certain views about this. On the right is William Jennings Bryan, who you may remember from the populist movement in the 19th century. But they both have the same concern, which is that Bitcoin is essentially outsourcing monetary policy to a system of equations. And the rate of growth of Bitcoin is supposed to be deterministic and to level off at 21 million Bitcoins a year. And as I learned economics, this would eventually cause deflation because even if the economy grew, the money supply would be fixed and we would all have to take a wage cut every year and feel that we got a raise if our cut wasn't too big and so forth. So I think there needs to be a way to increase the number of bitcoins. It turns out that there is, that there's this belief that is often reported in the press that you can um, essentially rely on this fixed total of 21 lifetime supply of bitcoin and it will never increase. But as I just spoke about, it really could be increased just by changing the code. We could just change the number and double it to 42 million, and if half of the network opted in, it would change the rules of the game. So the belief of the Bitcoin people and the virtual currency people is that you've replaced Janet Yellen and Ben Bernanke with a set of equations, that you've done <laughs> essentially what Milton Friedman would have wanted to do and created some optimal monetary policy. But They've ignored the fact that it's fixed only until you change it. And it can be changed by vote of the mob. And so what you've really done is replace Bernanke with the mob, or even worse, with hackers, and created monetary policy by some crude form of democracy. And again, to the extent that we have enemies that want to undercut our way of life and economy, and I think there's no shortage of these people, um, this would seem like a tailor-made point of entry for people who wanted to cause trouble. Um, these are abstract risks, maybe far into the future, but I think ultimately if these things are going to get traction and become widely used in commerce, there has to be much greater development of commercial law, the governance aspects have to be clarified, 
the security questions need to advance in a way that there really is deposit insurance. And these are big challenges given the way this thing is structured to be beyond the reach of any legal authority. So these are interesting classroom issues, but I think you look at them together and you can't help but be a little bit pessimistic about any of this stuff really becoming widely used in our lifetimes. Thank you.